blinded you took my hand and gently led oh how sweet it is to trust you and Jesus I believe what you say I believe
sky is gray above me Though I cannot see ahead Yet you promise to go with me And Jesus, I believe what you say I In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us to the conclusion of this workers' retreat. We thank you for what we have heard since we came. We thank you for how you have spoken directly to our hearts. We thank you for the many hearts that have been touched, positively influenced, transformed, and changed. We thank you because of the encouragement you have given every one of us. And we thank you because you are showing us that you will go with us. And that all your promises, there is none that will ever fail. And Lord, we believe what you have said to us. In that confidence, trust, and faith, we want to leave this place with the assurance that you are going to protect us every inch of the way in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we know that many, many promises you have given us in your word. And we know that none of your promises will fail. We pray, O oh Lord, that when we happen to be alone on our own, or when we're on the battlefield, or when we're surrounded by enemies and by great opposition, when the way seems tough, and when it appears the work is hard, we'll remember the words you have spoken to us, and we will manifest the faith that will be able to carry us through in Jesus' name. There is no mountain so high that you cannot put to the level ground. There is no river that is so wide that you cannot carry us across. And there is no demon that is so stubborn and so strong that you cannot overcome. There is no besetting sin that is so terrible that you cannot deliver your people from. There is no difficulty, there is no danger that is so great that you cannot rescue your people from. Therefore, Lord, we're looking up to you that as we go on in this race, in this journey, nothing will ever make us look back in Jesus' name. Father, we're looking up to you that at such a time when friends forsake us, 
when enemies seem to be near, when it appears there is no success, when it appears the doors and the gates are locked and closed, when it appears that we are being defeated, when it appears there is no way to progress or to succeed, Father, we pray at such a time you will remind us that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. That even though people may forsake us, you are ever present with us. And Lord, we know that you are taking us through. And Lord, we pray, whenever the devil comes with his lies, telling us that the Lord will not keep his word, may we, may we remember the singing that we have heard this morning, that Jesus will believe what you said unto us. And we know that eventually everything will be fine. Because at the end of the cloud, at the end of the rain, at the end of the storm, at the end of the winds that may blow, we know it will be all right on the other side. And Father, we pray that whatever it is that any of us may be going through, we just pray that this day you will remind us once again that you have never lost any battle. And that there is no power, there is no force that can ever defeat you. Help us, Lord, to walk in confidence. To walk with assurance. To know that we are the children of the King. And this is our Father's territory. Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And Lord, wherever we go, may we stand in that assurance that you are that God that will supply all our needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus and that you are able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think because there is that power that works in every one of us father we pray that none of us your children either a brother or a sister will live a sorrowful dejected life a hopeless life as if we are orphans in the world we know that behind us is the almighty is the great one and underneath is the everlasting arm father we pray that as your people your own servants the people you said you have not chosen me but i have chosen you and ordained you that you will go forth and bear fruit as they go forth this morning to the various places they have come from. How we pray that your angels will watch over them. Yeah. That any kind of contrary tongue against them, you will silence it in Jesus' name. Yeah. That these will be the mighty people of your power. Yeah. That they will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Yeah. That they will speak with new tongues. Yeah. That they will cast out devils. And if by chance any serpent, snake, physical or spiritual, come across their way, they will pick up those serpents and throw it into the fire of judgment. And anything they drink, anything they drink, I pray, O oh Lord, that all the poison within that thing, you just remove it and turn it into something that is a nourishing liquid for them in Jesus' name. That, Lord, even the prince of the power of the air shall not be able to stand before your people in Jesus' name. Because you said that greater you see that lives in us, in all your daughters, in all your sons, in the youngest convert, in the weakest house fellowship leader, and in the greatest, mightiest state overseer. Father, we pray from the youngest to the oldest, your power will never fail in our lives in Jesus' name. That every turn of the way, when Pharaoh comes, when the magicians come, when Balak and Balaam, when they appear, or when it is the Canaanites and the Jebusites that try to go against us, or when the kings come together in confederacy, or when it is Nebuchadnezzar that is heating his furnace, saying that he wants to throw your people into the furnace of fire. Or perhaps it is Herod. Or perhaps it is Nero. Or perhaps it is Caesar. Father, we pray that these people, the righteous people of God, will be bold as a lion in Jesus' name. 
that we will know that even the fire of the Kabnizer cannot burn your people. And that, Lord, when they go through fire, you will be with them. When they go through the waters, it will not drown them. Oh, I pray for all these, your people that are serving you, that have taken this long journey because they love you, because they want to hear from you. Lord, they have honored you. It is your time to honor them. They have esteemed you. They have exalted you. And they have lifted up your name on high. And Lord, it is your own time now to show that you are faithful, to show that you are a mighty God. Honor them in Jesus' name. When they speak in your name, honor their word. When they speak against demons, honor their word. When they speak against incurable disease, honor their word. When they speak against sin, against backsliding, honor their word. When they stand as your ambassador, as your representative, and they give altar call, calling sinners, calling backsliders to come to the Lord, honor and confirm their words in Jesus' name. When in the dead of the night, their children become sick, or their wives become sick, or their husband becomes sick. And the devil says, the pastor is not here. And the devil says, the leader is not here. And the devil says, the prayer warriors are not here. Oh Lord, I pray that the name of Jesus in their mouth will put the devil on the run in Jesus' name. At Lord, between now and eternity, your people will never lose any battle. They will go from strength unto strength, from grace unto grace, from glory unto glory. And Lord, when we all come to the shore on the other side, after we have labored, after we have preached, after we have fought the good fight of faith, and we all come to the other side, that Lord will be able to look back and will be able to say, not one. Of the good promises of the Lord he made to us ever failed. Lord, there are some people in this world, they say they are Christians. They don't know your power. They don't know your might. They don't know your support. They don't know your glory. They don't know all that you have provided for the people of God. But I pray that these people who are here this morning, they will be different people. Yeah. They will know your power. And they will never tremble before the enemy. Yeah. That Lord, every time the enemy comes like a mighty flood, you will lift up a mighty standard. Yeah. And that Lord, no weapon that is formed against any of these people will ever prosper in Jesus' name. Yeah. And whenever, oh Lord, any of these, your people, are forgetting. And they don't know. They do not know the great power that is supporting them, that is surrounding them. And like the servant of Elisha, they are about to cry, my father, my father, what are we going to do? Oh Lord, I pray that at such a time, you open their eyes. Like you open the eyes of the servant of Elisha to understand and to see that greater are they that be with us than they that be with them. And Lord, when it becomes necessary to blindfold those enemies and put a spiritual invisible handcuff in their hands and lead them over to Samaria and then open their eyes later to see that they are in the midst of the fire of the Holy Ghost that is able to consume. Oh Lord, I just pray that any of these, your children who are here this morning, members of the choir and among the ushers, the house fellowship leaders, area leaders, zona leaders, the coordinators, the region overseers, the state overseers, everyone here, oh Lord, I pray that from this moment on, we shall specialize in moving mountains. Specialize in healing the sick. Specialize in standing upon the promises of God. And we will never be defeated in Jesus' name. Lord, when it was when it was the right time, you used the Bora on the battlefield. When it was the right time, you used young Joshua on the battlefield. 
And David didn't have much, only smooth stones and a sling. And yet Goliath came down. Therefore, yeah, Lord, what you have given your people this week, from Wednesday night until this time, I pray, Lord, with that sling in their hand, with that stone in their, in their sling, I pray every Goliath will come down in Jesus' name. That, Lord, those of us in the past, that immediately after a workers' retreat or December retreat or Easter retreat or a special program in a region or state, then about two days we're discouraged again. We're dragging our feet. We're saying, where am I going to go now? Oh, Lord, I pray it will not happen like that this time in Jesus' name. But, Lord, you help us so that we can run the race. And, Lord, how I just pray that all the people that came to this workers' retreat, that they will never yield to the devil again in Jesus' name. You are able to keep us until that final day. And it is not your will that any of your people should perish. And these people who love you, who have come together, drinking in the water of the world and eating the bread of life, and they have just, you know, they don't care for food, they don't care for water, they don't care for any other thing, just wanting the word, wanting the word, wanting the word. Oh Lord, how I pray that you will so protect them. You will so anoint them. You will so energize them. That Lord, even the people that see them after this time, they will know they are being with Jesus Christ. Ordinarily, we would have thought that because your people have come from far north, and it's going to take a long, long time to reach home, one would have thought they would have run away and gone home, say, well, they cannot wait. They are running away, but they love you so much. They keep on staying, they keep on singing, they keep on praying. Oh Lord, won't you do something special for these people? How I just pray that your special blessing and your mighty blessing will be upon all these your people in Jesus' name. That Lord, as we write letters to one another, they will be letters of testimony. As they write from state to state, from region to region, from village to village and write to one another letters of fellowship and letters of faith and letters communicating together that those letters will be filled with faith in Jesus name Amen. how I pray that even now your mighty touch will be upon their children at home your mighty touch will be upon their loved ones at home that Lord as they go back these hands of theirs will anoint their hands that whatever they touch will be blessed of God and the people, when they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that all the discouragement and all the despair and all the things that are making us to sink in our spirit, remove everything in Jesus' name. And let your people, like a mighty army, rise up. And when we march to the north, then we are ready to capture the land for Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Yeah. We thank the Lord that has brought us to this time in our workers' retreat. I so much enjoy your fellowship and I so much appreciate your attitude. And I'm sure that you, you yourself, you so much appreciate the members of the choir. You know, they are with me in Lagos here, and I wonder how do they sing so well to these people coming from the north, and then I'm going to talk to them, they should sing better to us in Lagos here. You know, since you came, they have been singing so wonderfully, that you, you, are, you are saying how, how these Lagos people are enjoying so beautiful choir, and I am saying how these northern people are so lucky, or what have you done for them? That, you know, they just sing and they just turn us on. It's a wonderful time to be in the presence of the Lord. And I pray that such a fellowship like this will never end until we see the Lord face to face in Jesus' name. Uh, you know, in a fellowship of believers like this, we just ought to love one another. And uh, don't, uh, you know, be bearing grudge and somebody stepped on my toe and, you know, somebody did this and somebody did this. Because, you know, while you are bearing grudge like that, all the good, good things that God is doing, you can't even enjoy them. 
instead of looking up, instead of being bold, and instead of walking like the child of a king. And you go back to the north, and when, the, when those demons and those witches and wizards and all those powers, when they see you coming, you know, depending on how you walk, depending on your attitude, you know, if you walk like a child of the king, and you walk like you are coming from somewhere, because this is somewhere. I said this is somewhere. You walk like you are coming from somewhere, from the Mount of Transfiguration. Immediately they see you at a distance. They say this person is not like when he left. You better clear out of the way for this sister coming because if you stay there, her faith is going to run you down. Well, it's wonderful to, you know, to be with you this time. And uh, what am I going to preach to you now? Because uh, every one of you now, you can stand up and preach to me. You know, you are so filled with the word of God and with the power of God yourself. But all the same, uh, I will still share some verses of scripture with you. I'm talking on God's unfailing promises. God's unfailing promises. God loves us so much that he has made promises for us. For the present time and also promises for the future. When you think about the love of God, the wisdom of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, that God has given us promises, promises for what we need today, promises for our physical life, spiritual life, family life, promises that will take us through from now till we see him, then you understand he also gives us promises for eternity. It tells us what we're going to enjoy when we get over there. And you know that God, whatever he says, he actually means it. And he gives us these promises thoughtfully. He has thought about it. He has planned about it. And in deep thought and consideration, looking at what we will ever need, he knew that mountains will sometimes appear, so he has made promises to take care of that. He knew that there may be uncrossable, naturally uncrossable river. He has made promises to cover that. He knew that the enemy may rise up like a flood. He has made promises to cover that area too. He knew that in our own personal lives, the devil may want to come to attack. He has made promises to cover that area. Sickness may come. Poverty may knock at the door, or it may be adversity, or whatever it is. And God has made promises to cover every area of your life. That is why there is no Christian that can say, well, when the problems were too much, and I couldn't find any solution, that is why I turned back from the Lord. There can be nothing like that. You know why? Because God has made promises to cover every area of need in your life. Because he has treated us just like he treated the children of Israel. That he made promises to cover every area of their lives in 1 Kings chapter 8. And this is a testimony of a representative of the children of Israel. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 56. Blessed be the Lord that has given rest unto his people Israel. According to all that he promised, there has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, a servant. There has not failed one word of all the good promise of the Lord, which he promised by the hand of Moses. And you see, God has given us a greater than Moses in the person of Jesus Christ. And he said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Which means then, if the promises that God gave to the children of Israel through Moses, if God fulfilled everything, how much more? How much more will God fulfill the promises he has made unto us through our Lord Jesus Christ. If what brought these children of Israel unto relationship, reconciliation with God, is the blood of animals. And these who are brought to the Lord with the blood of animals, the promises God made to them, not one failed. How much more? Those of us who are brought unto God the Father through the blood of his only begotten Son, if he was faithful at that time 
to the children of Israel, how much more will he be faithful to the people of God, the church of the living God today? Don't you know that the covenant he made with Israel, we're told that was the first covenant. But finding fault with that covenant, he has made with us a new covenant. And if God was so faithful to the people of the old covenant, how much more will he be faithful to those of the new covenant? There has not failed one word of all his good promises which he has made unto us. You see, sometimes what makes us to think God will fail is because we're looking at circumstances and we do not know the intention of God. You see, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, then as they were going, they came to the Red Sea. When they got to the Red Sea, then they saw Pharaoh. They saw the chariots. You see, that may make you to think, now God has abandoned us. Now there is no way. And you see what happened? The Egyptians were coming, and God didn't appear to do anything. Why? The reason is because if God had done something at that time, maybe he had blown with a strong wind and these people had turned back to Egypt, that would have been a small thing. Because anybody could have said, you know, in the wilderness, winds blow anytime. And they would say, those people, the children of Israel, were so lucky. They would, they would count it as luck that it just so happened at that time. That the wind just blew and then confusion came and those people ran back. And God is not going to give the victory in your life to luck. He's going to give it to the supernatural. So he allowed them to keep coming. And while they kept coming, the children of Israel, like, you know, babies. And they were babes in the Lord at that time. You know, they had been slaves in Egypt for such a long time. And they began to cry. And when they cried, do you know that even what they said was negative and they were talking to moses and they said uh, uh, is there no grave in egypt that you have brought us to a point like this uh, you know sometimes uh, in our little thinking once you say something like that by mistake i'm not encouraging you to say something like that you shouldn't say something like that because you are workers and you know the bible and you mark all this your bible with red bible blue bible so your colorful bibles and you don't have right to say that but these children of israel they said that and any average preacher would have thought that well since you have said that now no miracle but god is not like that god is not like that even though they said are you have you brought us up here to die in this place look at the egyptians and then Moses cried unto the Lord. They cried unto Moses. Millions of them. About three million. According to a Bible experts. About three million people. Six hundred thousand hefty men. Then with their wives. Then with their children. That's how they get the three million. Then as they cried to Moses. And then Moses cried unto God. And then God said. Why are you crying to me? The power is in your hand. The rod is in your hand. Tell the children of Israel, everybody, move forward. He told them, stand still. God said, move forward. You know, sometimes in our counseling, when we look at the mighty problem, we look at the Red Sea, and we look at the Egyptians, we say, stand still. But God says, keep on marching. There's nothing to stand still about. There's nothing to stop your journey. And then stretch your rod. And he stretched his rod. Have you ever read it in your university book? That when they stretch rod, there is uh, no engine. There is no dynamo. There is nothing of, uh, you know, scientific technology. Just stretching the rod like this. The sea parted into two. And then the children of Israel passed over. The promises of God will be fulfilled supernaturally, whether science supports it or not. Whether it looks reasonable, natural, acceptable, possible, visible or not, it will happen in Jesus' name. Yeah. And then they passed over. Well, you will say, why didn't God stop the children of Egypt and the chariots not to follow after them? That's exactly what I'm saying. The miracle will not be supernatural enough. If he stopped them at that time, 
Why doesn't uh, God stop me from having sickness at all? The miracle will not be supernatural enough. Why doesn't God stop this from even knocking at my door? From this happening, from this happening, it will not be supernatural enough. Wait for God. When God finishes everything, you will know that that is what God should have done. And so the Egyptians, they kept, let's catch them, let's catch them. That's how some people are maybe saying about you. Let's catch him, let's catch her. Leave them alone. The person that will deal with them will deal with them. Yeah. And so they got, to the, they got to the middle of the sea. And now God touched all those wheels and, you know, removed some knots and things like that. And they began to struggle. Then they confessed, the God of Israel is fighting against the Egyptians. They will confess. They will open their mouth and say, your God is stronger than their idol. And then God told Moses, he said, Moses, look at them. Those people in the middle of the sea, the chariots. And they brought their powerful chariots, their, the equipment of Egypt. All they depended upon. You see, after they lost in that battle, it even weakened Egypt to fight another battle with any other person. After that person has fought with you, and by the power of God you have overcome, it's even going to weaken that way to fight against any other person again. And you know, eventually Moses stretched the rod, and the water just came, and washed every one of them away. They had that story in Jericho. Before the children of Israel got there, they had the story everywhere, and it sent fear into all of them. And I believe that that is the same God that has promised you that he will never leave you and he will never forsake you and as you go you will find that not one word of all his good promises will ever fail on your behalf in jesus name Amen. now you see as we go there are many promises in the bible and you better find out for yourself uh, how what these promises are and where the promises are uh, the promises on healing, you don't need for me to read that to you. You know that already. The promises of deliverance, you don't need a preacher to come. You can preach about that already for yourself. The promises about provision. The promises about knowing the will of God in marriage. The promises about how this will happen, how this will happen. You know that yourself. But let me give you some few promises that you may not be naturally or generally thinking about. In Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, reading from verse 12. Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. One of the difficulties we have when God calls us is, what will I preach? What will I say? How will I present my message? How will I be able to speak convincingly with power, with authority, with anointing, with unction? that the people will be able to yield unto the Lord. Maybe you are like Moses saying, that that is not my talent. That is not my gift. And it, is, it has not been mine before the Lord called me and after the Lord has called me to salvation. In fact, to stand up and give your testimony, maybe you say, it's even a difficulty for me. It's not my natural talent. And Moses said, I'm a stammerer. And I can't do the same. And I know the learning and the deeds of the Egyptians. Now, if you are going to call somebody to talk to the Egyptians, it must be somebody eloquent and fluent in control and command of the language. But I'm not like that, he said. And then God said, now therefore, go. And I will be with thy mouth. And this is what the Lord is telling you. In fact, Jesus Christ said, when he bring you before the council, before the governors, do not think or premeditate on what you are going to say. That the spirit of your father in you will speak through you. Now, what did those apostles knew to say? Before the Sanhedrin, or before the council of elders, or before all those people, don't you realize that the uh, disciples of Jesus Christ, uh, you know, the majority of them, about 7 out of 12, it appears they have been, you know, involved with fishing. Not only that, almost all of them are from the Galilee area. And if you know anything about the history of that time, all those Galileans, many of them are just fishers and farmers. And they, they were not raised in schools like in Jerusalem, like in, you know, some highly placed institutions of education at that time. 
and all these people, the uh, the, the non entities, so to say, and the, the people that were nothing, the basics of the world, God chose them. And then He said, when they bring you before the council, you shouldn't worry about what you are going to say. You know the fulfillment of that in Acts of the Apostles, chapter four. Just uh, listen. When they came and when they saw their boldness, and He took knowledge of them that they were unlearned men, then they said that these people had been with Christ. God fulfilled His promise. And so as you go back and you have to present the word of God, remember it is not the grammar that converts souls. It is not the fluency that converts souls. And it is not the, uh, the way you, you know, put all the structure together. It's not just that, that converts souls. There are people that can talk better than many of us who are in the church, but you see their talent have not been yielded unto the Lord. But God has uh, told you today, I will go, therefore go. I will be with thy mouth. What will that mean for Moses? A lot of things. Number one, it will mean that when Moses came to the children of Israel, those who have been in captivity for generations, for, for centuries, and he said, the Lord God of your fathers has sent me unto you. God said, I will be with your mouth. So to so present ye to those children of Israel that were resting within their captivity, and they will arise and be willing to follow you. Number two, that when you will challenge Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh was, you know, this individual that was like an emperor, like a great person, because at that time, the Egyptian empire actually had risen to a very high level. And even other kings of other nations and other places will not find it easy to come and talk unto Egypt. The power of Egypt, the science of Egypt, the knowledge of Egypt, the deeds of Egypt, and all the things that made them proud. And as an emperor like that, as a great, great fellow like that, to go and talk to him, it will take somebody more than Moses. And yet he said, I will go with you. Therefore go, I will be with your mouth. When you come before those uh, people, that person, Pharaoh. Then the Egyptians, what? The Egyptians had their magicians. You see, in those early days, they developed magic and sorcery. An enchantment they, 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 they developed it to a very high level and actually history books uh, tell us the, the level into which they developed it at that time and they would look at the stars and look at this and be able to predict this and predict that and the Moses knew all about that and he felt how can I confront those people they will so challenge me that I will not know what I will say but then it says go and I will be with thy mouth there were the task masters and if you know anything about masters, masters are people that always like to give commands and instruction. They never like to listen. There were task masters over the children of Israel. And these people were just there, having taken laws into their hands, and they will not listen to anybody. And they will just put great tasks and difficult tasks upon these people. And you know when somebody has been like a master, a master of slaves, driving them, and scourging them, that is beating them, and you're treating them, and telling them, do this, do this, and you cannot talk. Now for a person now, coming from the race of those slaves, to come and talk, and say, let these people go. But then God said unto Moses, even before all those taskmasters, you can go, I will be with your mouth. And then as you go back to your states, and to your regions, to your local government, to your district, wherever you have come from, the Lord is saying, go. And I will be with your mouth. Amen. You know, sometimes if you have been a preacher in a particular place for a long time, there are some of your members, perhaps, maybe because of their authority, because of their education. Sometimes uh, they talk to you in a very wrong way, in a fierce way. And it appears that that has weakened you. For example, it may so happen. That in your, in your locality, where you are preaching, maybe you are just a primary six fellow before the Lord called you. And now you are a preacher of the word of God. But the problem you have is that whenever you read, you know, the Bible, uh, sometimes you will pronounce some words that uh, you really, you don't pronounce well. And therefore that fellow that, uh, you know, is in the secondary school, 
uh, maybe GSS-1 or GSS-2 or whatever. Uh, you know, they have taught them the phonetics and the grammar. Uh, and this fellow wanting to show you that, you know, he knows grammar. You are just an illiterate pastor. He might come to you at the end of the service and say, Pastor, that is not how they pronounce that word. This is how they pronounce the word. And then the following Sunday, maybe you preach again. And sure enough, this, uh, you know, little fellow boy will come and say, Pastor, I've come again. Uh, there were three words you pronounced wrongly today. And then he pronounced the first one and the second one and the third one. And, uh, you know, you don't want to get angry as a child of God. You don't want to be proud as a child of God. You don't want to do anything negative. Uh, therefore, just say, God bless you, my young brother. Uh, just listen to the message and make sure it touches your heart. Leave all this phonetics and grammar. Uh, but next Sunday again, you know, when you uh, preach and all that, it says, well, today it is not the pronunciation of the word now. It is the grammar. Because I noticed that in your story, you are talking about something in the future, in the future. But all of a sudden, you are using past tense. And we are saying they were instead of it will be uh, so... Uh, you say, oh, when you hear all that, then you become afraid in preaching. You say, I don't know what I will say that this young boy will come again today. He says, don't worry about all that grammar. That even with all the bad grammar, I will be with your mouth. Yeah. You know, uh, D.L. Moody did not, uh, if, have you heard of D.L. Moody before? He's an evangelist of the past generation. And he wasn't a very educated individual. On the other hand, Charles G. Finney was highly educated. And Charles G. Finney was, you know, preparing to be a lawyer. In fact, he had become a lawyer. And that man really understood law. And he could argue. And his reasoning, his logic was superb. And of course, his way of speaking was just like a lawyer will present something. D.L. Moody, on the other hand... Uh, did not, uh, you know, finish uh, school, and the Lord called him, and there were a lot, a lot of grammatical mistakes. But thank God, in the midst of the grammatical mistakes, the unction of the Spirit was there. The power of the Spirit of God was there. And one day, uh, D.L. Moody was preaching uh, somewhere, and uh, there was a professor in that meeting, and that professor listened and couldn't sit still in his uh, chair. Because, you know, well, D.L. Moody will be saying something, good illustration and good interpretation, but he will blow the grammar. And then the professor will, you know, adjust his seat and feel how can, how can somebody be like this, talking like this. And uh, before that professor recovers from that, uh, you know, bad grammar, uh, you know, D.L. Moody will blow another one again. <laughs> and then eventually D.L. Moody finished uh, that message. And then gave the altar call. And the people with tears on their eyes. You know, on their faces. Coming and praying and repenting and surrendering to the Lord. And it was a wonderful result. And the professor came and said, I don't think you are connected with this. Because all that I see, the power, the anointing, and the way the people respond to the preaching of the gospel... It's not because of you, it's in spite of you. That means, if it were because of you, nothing will happen. And the D.L. Moody said, I'm so happy, I have nothing to do with this. This is the work of God. And as you go back to your locations, you may look like that and you may be like that. That, you know, some people will compare you with brother so-and-so. They will compare you with sister so-and-so. Never mind, you are not brother so-and-so. And you are not sister so and so. You are just a child of God, saved by grace and called by his spirit. And whatever God has given you to do, go and do it. They say you blow grammar, say praise the Lord. They say that that structure is not correct, you say praise the Lord. You know, sometimes we want to copy good preaching. And it's good to copy good things. Um, you know, if you see somebody that is wearing good shoe, you say, where did you buy that? You see somebody that is having, you know, a good uh, tie, you say, where did you get that? It's all right to copy good things. So we want to copy good things and want to say point one, point two, point three, And that is marvelous. The only problem with some people is that you mention point one, and then you mention point two. And then when you mention point three, point three is just, you know, another way of saying point one. And, and somebody says, well, actually the points to give, they are not three, they are only two. You say, what? I did point one, point two, point three. Then he explained to you that actually your third point, 
when you really understand those uh, words properly, it's exactly like point one. Anyway, uh, did people get saved? Yes, I saw them get saved. Forget about points one, two, and three. Go, and I will be with your mouth. You see, God is telling you, don't look at your natural weakness. Don't look at your natural inability. Don't look at the areas you have been making mistakes and you're not able to do what you think you ought to do. It says, go, and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. God will teach you what you will say. He will put the word in your mouth and you will discover that those little words coming out of your mouth they will convert souls in Jesus' name. And they will teach people and make them to come to the Lord in Jesus' name. Then in Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1 verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Here was Joshua. And obviously Joshua must have been feeling uh, quite inferior to Moses. Well, because Joshua knew the life of Moses. In fact, in the very uh, last chapter of uh, Deuteronomy, just a chapter before this chapter in Joshua, look at it, chapter 34 of Deuteronomy. And in verse 10, And there arose not a prophet since in Israel, like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, in all the signs and the wonders, which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. You see, when you take um, another person's place like that, that is, you take the place of a man like Moses. Moses had been so powerful, so mightily used of God, that everybody knew it, everybody recognized it. Now Joshua was taking that place. And then Joshua as a younger fellow, must have been thinking, every time I preach, these people are going to be comparing me with Moses. Every time I try to say something, they, tr they are going to be comparing me with Moses. Every time I try to do this or that, and I say, let's march on, we're going to get this, we're going to get that, they're going to be comparing it with Moses. And then God said, don't worry about that. Because every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses, which means the same way I was with him, the same way I will be with you. The things I did with him, that same, those same things I will do with you. And therefore you do not allow anything to make you timid, to make you afraid. You do not allow anything to make you begin to feel, can I do it, can I not do it? And then to begin to say, well, if they had appointed brother so and so to do it. He is more effective. He would have been uh, able to do it better than I'm able to do it. But God has told you already. As I said unto Moses, I'm saying unto you. Every soul, the, every place the soul of your foot shall tread upon. I have given it unto you. Knowing where you are coming from. And the various tribes that are in all those places. Although the people in the south here they feel that when you come from the north there's only one tribe no it's not like that there are many tribes up north and you know the difficulty of this religion and this ideology and this ceremony and this uh, uh, society and a lot of things that you begin to feel will people ever be converted in this area Will people ever yield to the gospel in this area? But look at the word of God. Every place the soul of your foot shall tread upon. That have I given unto you. If God says he has given the place unto you, why don't you wait there patiently until God himself will do it. And you will know this is the fulfillment of the promise of God. Then in verse 5, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee. And you will know that there are people in your ministry, that is, as you continue in ministry, that will try to challenge your authority, that will try to challenge your calling, that will try to challenge your ministry. But the word of God says, and this is the promise of God unto you, and this promise of God will never fail. It says, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. 
You see, in um, Lagos here, we have experienced some uh, dramatic miracles. Wonderful, wonderful things. But uh, the majority of uh, people who are not with us in Lagos, they think that these things are happening because of uh, so-and-so, or because of so-and-so, but not totally like that. Uh, one of our meetings some time ago, on a Thursday, we, I was uh, giving the word, and I was led of the Spirit of God to tell the people that when they go back, they should pray, and whatever the problem they have at home, that the Lord is going to solve that problem. And here was a particular sister, and uh, this sister, to the best of my knowledge, uh, had not gone to all the schools that many of us have gone to. Uh, she couldn't, uh, you know, even read and understand the English Bible. She only used the Bible in her native language. But uh, she was in the meeting that day. And I said, we're all children of God if you are born again. And I said, born again child of God, no enemy shall be able to stand before you. And that there shall not be a man that will be able to stand before you. And I therefore that house in which you are living, where the wife of the uh, landlord is having this evil spirit and this one and that one, you go back home. When you get back home, close your door. Lock your door and begin to pray. And if you don't know how to pray, just mention the name of Jesus. That's prayer. When you mention that name that name and i and i can give you you know testimonies concerning just mentioning that name and uh, you know i i tell a lot of stories when i preach i'll come back to the woman in lagos let me go to a man somewhere else uh, you see somebody had died and i said this fellow died then they called these people in uh, to pray actually he was sick to the point of death but while they were there he just gave up and you know what they did is that they held hands together in a circle. And that person was in the middle. And he didn't know any other thing to say, only Jesus. Jesus. Just calling that name. Just calling that name. They didn't say, raise her up, heal her, deliver her, we bind the devil. We do, they, I don't know whether they didn't, why they didn't say that, but they didn't say so. They just called Jesus. And do you know just that name? Just that name. And that person eventually got up, jumped up, everything was all right, and he joined them calling Jesus. Yeah. Can you join me and call that name Jesus? Yeah. That's the name. That's the name. If you forget how to pray, if the devil is saying you will not make it, you remember that name. Call that name Jesus. Let me come back to the woman in Lagos so that we don't keep her waiting too long. And so you see this woman in Lagos, I said, hey, when you get back home, hey, the problem, you, whatever the problem is, just call that name Jesus and lock your door and pray. And you know, this woman got back home and you know, that same night, you know, I thank God for people that don't know too much grammar. Those people, they obey God promptly. Educated people and university people that studied geology and mathematics and calculus and modern science and you know all these things, they will still be blowing grammar. How can that be? But you know, this woman, thank God for a woman like that. You know, the woman that don't the, the woman that didn't know how to argue just went back home and then locked her door and knelt down and began to pray. And then the wife of the landlord being uh, a witch the fire began to burn that woman and this woman did not know when she began to pray out loud and people were hearing outside so they started knocking the door stop it it's enough stop it it's enough the prayer of an illiterate not a house fellowship leader not a worker not an area leader not a zonal leader where have you put your authority if those people that are not workers, she cannot even attend, she couldn't attend workers' retreat at that time. If those who could not attend workers' retreat are bringing fire upon witches, where is your authority as a zonal leader? And you are saying, eh, they are tormenting, who are the people tormenting you? Torment them back with the fire of the Holy Ghost. 
and uh, you know when when that woman was hearing the knock saying stop it that's enough uh, the fire is burning me then that woman knew that ah, ah, so prayer is so powerful like this and she continued praying and praying well eventually when she opened the door the woman and the husband decide you are going to leave this house. You are going to leave this place. We are the landlord. Uh -uh. What is the matter with you? And the woman now, you know, the woman now, even though illiterate, even though she didn't know much, she said, no, I will not leave. If anybody is to leave, maybe you have to leave. And um, before the following Thursday that we came together, the third day, the wife of that landlord had convinced the landlord to pack out and go and rent house. And they left that house for the illiterate woman. No man shall be able to stand before you. As you go, there is, there is nothing to fear. What are you fearing? That to a child of God you are pregnant. And then they say that one witch is somewhere will, will suck your pregnancy. I didn't read that in the New Testament. That a child of God. It's because we don't know our authority. But this money, you know your authority. Yeah. That nothing shall by any means hurt you in Jesus' name. Yeah. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, you see that again. Joshua might have been thinking, well, Moses was lucky. Moses was fortunate. Because he was a man that God spoke to face to face. And God said, just as I did with Moses, I will do with you. And he says, I will not fail you. I will not fail you. Brothers and sisters, as we are going back, God will not fail you. Yeah. When you call upon him, he will answer. When you pray unto him, he will do it. Then he says, I will not forsake you. The Lord will not forsake us. The Lord will not leave us. Now, Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1 and in verse 19. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 19. They shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, says the Lord, to deliver thee. They will fight, but that doesn't mean you shall run away from the place of battle. They will fight against you, but they will not prevail against you in the name of the Lord. In Matthew chapter 28, reading from verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. So then, as you go back, just teach whatever the Lord has commanded. If I preach uh, repentance, will not the people hate me? He says, if you preach repentance, because that is what I've commanded, I will be with you. I will be with you to work miracle. I will be with you to confirm that word of repentance. I will be with you to draw souls into the kingdom. What if I preach restitution? Will the people not say it is too hard and therefore they don't want to stay? He says, I will be with you to help you keep the people. You cannot keep the people. You cannot make them stay. I will be with you to keep the people. What if I preach holiness? When all the other churches all around are saying that it doesn't matter what you do. You are eternally secured even if you are living in sin. And then I come to preach something different. Will not the people just say, well, they cannot abide that. The holiness message is too much. It says, if you preach what I told you to preach, I will be with you. And it says, always. And what if I preach healing? Because, you see, all these other churches where we are coming from, they don't believe in healing. They don't believe that God can heal today. What if I preach it? Will that not mark me as a different person? It says, if you go to teach all the things I've commanded you, it says, I will be with you always, and the Lord will be with you. 
what if you preach and then there is, uh, you know, a smuggler or there is a thief or there is, uh, you know, a fellow in that place that is, you know, is going to say, uh, that example you mentioned, that illustration that you made is going against me. And because of that, we're going to drive you out of this place. And they begin to plan and begin to brag. It says, don't worry about that. Leave that in the hands of God. It says, I will be with you. The only condition is teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And you see, that is what the Lord has been helping us to do. When we started in this a deeper life some years ago, there were people that, you know, spoke and they said, if you continue preaching restitution and holiness and, you know, living straight and all these things you are teaching in the word of God, we know it's in the Bible, but it is hard. And nobody can do it today. And if you continue, you will see that the work will not grow. If you want the work to grow, lessen all this holiness and this, and don't worry about, you know, people wear earrings and you are going to spoil the message if you continue saying that. Or palm their head or you know wear whatever they want to hear all these women if you are preaching that they don't shouldn't wear slaps according to deuteronomy if you are preaching the word of god straight and you know firm unto them that you are not going to be able to have them well we thank god here today the workers retreat we're having now is only one out of six workers retreats we're going to have and you are not just ordinary members you are workers and to even have workers retreat, we cannot have one session. We cannot have two, three. We cannot have four. Originally, I divided it to five, thinking we're going to have only five. Eventually, I saw that if we have five, each one will be so much we cannot control the crowd. We have to divide it into six. What is said, if we preach, people will run away. The more we preach the Bible, the more the people are coming. And some of you that I see here, I've never met you before. I, I don't know where you have come from. Only that the Holy Ghost has told you that this is a place to come. And you are here. And I'm happy you are here. And you go back into your places and preach the same word of God. And as God has been with us, God will be with you. He will not allow you to be put to shame. Whatever difficulty, whatever problem you have, the Lord will solve everything for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Whatever miracle you have had has been done here. Whatever answer to prayer you had, God has done here in your village, in your locality, in your local government, in your region, where you have come from. The same miracle and mightier miracles God will do through you in Jesus' name. Amen. All God requires is that you will be faithful to him. And you will find God will be so powerful. And you know, if you are poor, God will provide. Some of you have come from uh, villages and localities where you say, well, I cannot even, uh, you know, build a little church in the place I'm coming from. And you come to a place like this and say, ah, what is, uh, look at all this. If they can just give me one hall here, and they give me a trailer to carry that hall to my place in the north, that will be enough for me. Never mind, God will do more than that in your place. Yeah. If you are faithful unto God, he'll provide. Because God will supply your need. The need of the ministry, the need of your life, the need of your family. Every need God will supply in Jesus' name. Yeah. Or will God fail? No, our God will not fail. Standing on the promises of God, we know that we cannot fail. Before I come to a close... I want you to look at Psalm 37. And in verse 25, I have been young and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. As the blood of Jesus Christ made you righteous, then he will never forsake you. He will stay with you. It may appear that things are tough for five minutes, for one hour, even for one day. Never mind. I've not seen the righteous forsaken. And remember, please, that the man that God used to write this psalm was David. And he had problems. He had difficulties. And yet he said, I've not seen the righteous forsaken. He may have problems, but God will not forsake you. The storm may blow upon your sheep on the sea, but God will not forsake you. 
And whatever the storm, whatever the wind, whatever the difficulty, once it doesn't forsake you, will meet on the other side. And I believe that as you go, the word of God is going with you. The anointing of the spirit is going with you. And the authority of the name of Jesus is going with you. As we disperse and you go to your various locations. And we're not as many as we are like this in your location. Don't be lonely because of that. My prayers are going with you. And Jesus Christ himself, seated on the right hand of majesty on high, is interceding for you. And a lot of other people, too, during this retreat, we have met, you have met one another. And oh, is there another brother, so oh, brother, you are around here. Sister, you are around here. I want to encourage you as you go back, pray for one another. Let your prayers reach another region reach another state and reach another district and reach another local government and reach another village as we just send prayers all across like that i believe that in every location we have come from the devil will never succeed against us in jesus name as we go i want to remind you the promise of the lord that no weapon that is passioned against you can prosper don't fear them. Don't even talk about them. Just neglect them and continue to do the work God has given you to do. And everything that God has written down that will be accomplished through your life and through your ministry will be accomplished in Jesus' name. We'll rise up and we'll just praise the Lord and thank the Lord and glorify the Lord and talk to God with faith and confidence. Knowing that the God who has called us will never disappoint us. We can stand on the unfailing promises of God. He has promised he will never leave you, he will never forsake you. He will never leave you, he will never forsake you. His promises will never fail.
his promises will never fail. He will be with your mouth. Every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon, God has given unto you. No man, no enemy, no witch, no wizard will be able to stand before you. Amen.
Jesus name we pray in Jesus name we pray in Jesus name we pray Almighty and eternal God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ we magnify your holy name we lift you up because you are a wonderful God because you are a faithful God because your mercies never fail we thank you father because our eyes are seeing what we are seeing our ears are hearing what we are hearing and you have made us particles of your grace father we bless your holy name in jesus name almighty and eternal god we thank you because you have made us members of the deeper life bible church we thank you because you have made us Workers in the Deeper Life Bible Church, we cannot praise you enough. We cannot thank you enough. We bless and we honor your holy name. Accept our praises in Jesus' name. Amen. Eternal Father, we thank you because you have been here in your presence the last three days. And Lord, it is as if we should not live here anymore. Like Peter said, let us set their tabernacles. Father, we are praying that your very presence that we have felt here it will go with us in Jesus' name. Amen. According to your word, you said that not one of your promises will has fallen to the ground. And Lord, not one of the promises of God that you have reminded us this morning, that is in the word of God, that we have read ourselves, will fall to the ground concerning us in Jesus' name. Amen. And almighty God, as we go, we go in your name. We go in your power. We go in your mind. And we know that your very presence will continue with us in Jesus' name. Amen. You said that wherever the soul of our feet shall tread, you have given it to us as an inheritance. Oh Lord, as our brothers and sisters will go to the north, as we will go down here into Lagos, Father, in the name of Jesus, we are praying that wherever we tread, oh Lord, according to your promise, they belong to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, all the doors that you have opened, Oh Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, the doors that have been shut before, that the enemy and the stronghold has, has held and abide the people from hearing the word of God. As we go now with the power of God, as we go with the touch of God upon our lips, as we declare the truth of the word of God, Lord, all those doors will be opened in Jesus' name. Amen. Spectacular turning unto Christ, we are going to witness in Jesus' name. Amen. Spectacular miracles you are going to experience in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, where there has been discouragement, Almighty God, we thank you because you have given us strength. And Lord, you, the God, the Almighty God, the captain of the host, Joshua said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Jesus said, As the captain of the host of God, have I come. And Lord, you have gone before us to fight these battles for us. And Lord, we are overcomers in Jesus' name. In our own hands, your work will progress. In our own time, the work will progress. Lord, we are praying that, Lord, as we are doing the work, consolidation, conservation will be our objective in Jesus' name. As they are coming to the Lord, they will continue in the word of God in Jesus' name. The back door of backsliding, this morning you have shut it. It remains short in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, where there has been weakness, we pray, Lord, that you continue to grant us strength. Amen. Enable us to know that this battle is not our battle. We cannot fight it with physical weapons. We have no weapons to be able to fight this battle. But, Lord, you are fighting the battle for us. Amen. You have gone ahead of us. Oh, Lord, as we go to our locations, Lord, we will see the power of God upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. We will know that you, God Almighty, you are with us in Jesus' name. Amen. And Lord, as we pray for one another, as we agonize for one another in prayer, Father, great will be the work that you do through us and in us and with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you and bless your holy name. We praise you because you are a good God. We honor you and we adore you. You are a wonderful God. You are a faithful God. You are a merciful God. And Lord, together now, we lift up our hearts in thanks and gratitude to your holy name. Let us lift up our hearts in gratitude to the Lord, because he has been good unto us. 
He has been faithful unto us. He has been kind unto us. He has not taken his word from us. Let us bless the name of the Lord. Let us lift up his holy name. He is a good God. He is a merciful God. Let us bless his holy name. Let us magnify his holy name for all that he has done for us, for his favor that he has shown, for opening the word of God unto us. Let us bless the name of the Lord. to us. Amen. Amen.